Kara Samatsa in India, Andhra Pradesh. He will be virtually uh, uh, meet with us. And Mr. Tunç Soyar, mayor of Izmir from Turkey. And Mr. Ahyani, regional secretary of the Surakara city government from Indonesia will be also virtual. And Francisco Jose Juan Rocha, Muro de Castro uh, from uh, Coordination of International Relations, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And Elizabeth Gulugulu Makache, co chair of the Yango Food and Agriculture Working Group and African Youth Initiatives on Climate Change, Zimbabwe. Uh, welcome uh, to our first panel today. And if I am without going further uh, introduction about our panelists, because I don't want to spend too much time. We are already a little late and we are running very uh, short schedule, not to make you delay for your next events. Uh, so uh, we have some uh, specific questions about our part uh, to our participants. And uh, let me start first uh, from Minister Jorda. Uh, the question is, why is it important to link food and climate policies? And what are your main policy priorities in doing so? Please, Minister of Jorda, welcome to the panel. Uh, the question will be maximum answer will be two to three minutes, please. That would be perfect if we follow the time uh, limitation. Muy bien, muchas, muchas gracias. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Un placer estar hoy en el Ayuntamiento de Glasgow y uh, formando parte de este fantástico panel. Intentaré uh, ser uh, diligente y cumplir estos dos minutos. Bueno, sin duda las políticas uh, de acción climática y las agroalimentarias uh, deben planificarse y no solo planificarse, deben ejecutarse uh, desde una gobernanza compartida entre todos los actores implicados. De hecho, se trata básicamente de poder hacer compatible la producción de alimentos, importantísimo, con la contribución de la mitigación del cambio climático. Y eso debemos llevarlo a cabo nosotros, a nuestro entender, en base a tres acciones. La primera, la conservación y la mejora de la utilización de los recursos naturales, garantizando también la producción agrícola, Evidentemente, la segunda, la protección y la preservación de los recursos naturales de los que depende este sistema alimentario, básicamente suelo, agua, aire, y a través de la reversión, como no puede ser de otra manera, de la pérdida de biodiversidad. Um, ante la amenaza climática no tenemos muchas alternativas, de hecho, no tenemos otra alternativa que caminar juntos. Sin duda, ¿eh? el reto es global y por tanto la respuesta también tiene que ser global y transformadora. Muy rápido, en Cataluña hemos elaborado uh, una estrategia, una estrategia alimentaria, la que denominamos el Plan Estratégico de la Alimentación de Cataluña 2021-2026, que tiene uh, como uno de sus diez objetivos estratégicos el de garantizar que el sistema alimentario catalán se convierta en una herramienta también de mitigación de la emergencia climática, aprovechando a la vez su capacidad de, de sumidero de gases de efecto hibernáculo, hibernadero, perdón, y preservar y a la vez restablecer uh, los recursos ecosistémicos de los que depende. Estamos ahora en la fase de elaboración de esta estratégica, que tiene un horizonte uh, para el 2030, y en el caso, es evidente que en el caso de Cataluña y, y no solo de Cataluña, eh, también en general de, de todo el Mediterráneo, el cambio climático pone una presión uh, sobre la producción de alimentos muy, muy, muy importante. Eh. Esto es por diversas causas. Y para nosotros es importantísimo que todos estos alimentos uh, se produzcan y se hagan evidentemente con uh, la calidad uh, que se requiere y a la vez también 
eh, preservando evidentemente eh, el, cambio, el cambio climático. Y para último, déjame decir también que la industria agroalimentaria en nuestro país eh, es responsable también de una parte significativa de los gases, gases de efecto hibernáculo. Y por lo tanto es imprescindible una mejor um, detección y un mejor tratamiento también de las deyecciones ganaderas. ¿eh? Y también no solo de las deyecciones ganaderas, sino también en este caso, y en esto estamos muy obsesionados, con las energías renovables en los ámbitos, en los ámbitos rurales. Y acabo diciendo que la consejería um, que tengo el honor de, de cabezar... Uh, tiene por nombre uh, Departamento de Acción Climática, Alimentación y Agenda Rural. ¿eh? Fijaros que uh, para nosotros la alimentación está en el centro, pero es evidente también que es muy importante lo que decía, ¿eh? uh, ligar uh, las políticas agroalimentarias con las políticas ambientales y con el territorio. ¿eh? Por eso la Agenda Rural uh, que pone también en el centro de las políticas la cohesión uh, territorial. Thank you, thank you, Minister Jorda. You will have another opportunity for second and third questions. Now, the second question to Mr. Mura de Castro, Mr. Ahiani Siddiq, and Minister Jorda again. Here are the questions. Uh, what motivated you to sign the Glasgow Declaration? Why is it important? We can start from uh, Mr. Mura de Castro, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the city of Sao Paulo became a part of the Glasgow Food and Declaration, uh, Food and Climate Declaration, because sustainable food policies must be a blueprint movement for local governments around the world. We recognize and support the Glasgow Declaration as a groundbreaking commitment to the need to address local agriculture in the fight against climate change and the importance of cities in achieving this goal. It is important to consider that food systems are currently responsible for around 25 to 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions and are at the heart of biodiversity loss. So we must act on coherent and co comprehensive policies to meet the Paris Agreement requirements. Multi-scale food policies support food systems in the city of Sao Paulo is deeply committed to address these challenges in its territory. So the city of Sao Paulo has one uh, specificity that one third of our municipal territory is actually a rural land. So the largest city in the global south has one third of its territory with uh, ag active agricultural activities. Um, the declaration is a call to action to acknowledge the impact integrated uh, of integrated food systems on an interaction of components in uh, local agriculture, human health, biodiversity, carbon footprint, food distribution, and waste disposal. It is also a reminder that local governments seek support to implement resilient and circular policies on, its, on this system as a whole, considering initiatives and stakeholders associated with food and climate. It raises an awareness that cities are drivers of change towards sustainable food systems to close the gap between structural levels of governments. So in Sao Paulo, we produce and we consume. So it's, it's full circle. Sao Paulo is well known for opposing uh, Brazil's federal government uh, and its denial of climate change. So we endorse a statement, this statement that emphasizes the key role of local governments and the transforming potential of cities. Our city celebrates this uh, unified voice of diverse actors in subnational management given the importance and the key role of urban food systems for climate action and all positive changes towards sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. De Castro. Now we have the virtual uh, participants from Indonesia. Please, Mr. Ahyane Siddiq, uh, welcome uh, to virtually Glasgow. Thank you. It's clear my sound. Okay, I will brief about uh, participation of Surakarta City. We would like, we would like to thank, uh, uh, invited in this forum because uh, Surakarta City very interested with uh, climate change and uh, food, how to prepare food for 
Surakarta City. The motivation of our Glasgow Declaration because on, in the mind with the characteristic of Surakarta City, Surakarta City is very small city, limited open space. There is no natural resource and densely populated almost uh, 2 million people in uh, 44 square kilometer. This is very dense, more or less about 13,000 per square kilometer. At the day, this is uh, very, very dense. And also it is in touch with uh, economic activity because our city is become an inner city from the surrounding uh, area that covers about uh, 6 million people. So it is uh, very dense and uh, receive uh, commuters from surrounding, surrounding region. Also because the to de uh, in developing and integrating good strategies is one of the tools to cope the climate change. Because uh, in our city, in our city, we have no natural resource, no 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 any uh, open space, and almost more than eighty percent area is built up area. Because we are also developing the stakeholder awareness to coordinate. Uh, on food system. Also, this knowledge and experience sharing with other cities from our the world. Because in this uh, forum, I think we can uh, learn how the other city from around the world they can manage integrating, integrating about how to fulfill food also collaboration with uh, climate uh, to to face with the adverse of climate change second about the policies from our city government in implementing to reduce the adverse impact of climate change on food system we are we have three policies first is regional action plan in on food and nutrition we have of uh, five pillars. First is improve community nutrition, and then second, increase access to diverse food, improve food quality and safety, and ensure and the clean and healthy environment. And the fifth is to improve the coordination of food and nutrition development. Secondly, this about the climate change adaptation on food security. There are uh, four strategies. There is, has, there is a adjustment of farming system and then development of adaptive technology and optimization of water and limited land, also other resource. And then the last is development of efficient food distribution and supply. The last policies is about the activities. We, on how to collaborate people, community, uh, community in our city, we, we have many group of urban farming farmers. There is more than six, 64 groups that produce in last year about 1207 tons about agricultural products products and 6300 tons livestock product and fishery about 46 tons in last year this is 10 minutes in uh, how we develop in this group with uh, urban farming system also in the community, we also develop uh, like such, such as a uh, food sharing. That says, in such area, there is they produce in different livestock, and then this they can change it with others. So this can 
fulfill uh, from each other. Also, this healthy school cafeteria. This is how we try to input to impose the policy start from the children or from the school, from the school. So it is. I have to interrupt you. I'm very sorry. You have other option to speak, but now you are way beyond the three minutes. So I have to stop you and you will come again for another uh, answer. I'm, I'm very okay. sorry. Now, can, can you understand me? Because we are running very late and I don't want to take other speakers time. So Minister Jorda, please. Just two minutes, due minute for the second uh, uh, question, motivation of Glasgow Declaration. Muy bien, pues con dos minutos. Eh, el gobierno de, de mi país está firmemente comprometido en desarrollar políticas de alimentación, lo he dicho antes, que sean sostenibles, promover también mecanismos de acción conjunta y reubicar, evidentemente, la alimentación y la agricultura en el centro de la respuesta global ante la emergencia climática. Entendemos que existe una necesidad de, de abordar la emergencia climática a través de políticas alimentarias integradas y precisamente ahí radica la importancia de esta declaración y por eso hoy estamos contentos de estar aquí. El cambio climático amenaza nuestra capacidad, también es verdad, de, de conseguir la seguridad alimentaria mundial y a la vez también erradicar la pobreza y obtener un desarrollo que sea sostenible. Por eso tenemos la necesidad también de involucrar a todos los actores clave, que son muchos, del sistema alimentario en la toma de decisiones para la transición sostenible y a la vez también, a nuestro entender, justa. Y por todo ello, y voy acabando, el gobierno catalán se adhirió a esta iniciativa. Por estar totalmente alineada con los objetivos de nuestra estrategia alimentaria, el plan estratégico que he explicado antes de la alimentación de Cataluña y en definitiva como sociedad, y ahora sí que acabo, um, uh, tenemos que entender uh, o atender entender y atender a la vez un seguido de, de, de tensiones que se producen ¿no? como sociedad y tenemos que entenderlas también como, como administración, como país. La primera, atender la demanda de alimentos. Muy importante, evidentemente, porque en Cataluña tenemos la manía de comer cinco veces al día. ¿eh? Entonces, esto es importante. La segunda, la presión sobre los recursos naturales, que no son infinitos. La tercera, el mantenimiento de la capacidad productiva, para nosotros extremadamente clave. Cuatro, los patrones alimenticios, alimentarios, que para nosotros tienen que ser evidentemente saludables. Y, por último, la transición de una política agraria a una política alimentaria. ¿eh? Ahí me gustaría detenerme más uh, minutos, pero entiendo que he eh, agotado el tiempo. Sí. ¿Sí? Gracias, muchas gracias. Now the fourth question is, uh, no, sorry, third question to uh, going to virtual again all the way from India, our good friend Vijay Kumar. And Mrs. Gulugulu, which is representative of youth. So the uh, question is, what are the challenges and opportunities to connect climate change policies with food system policies? What is missing and sorely needed? Kumar, uh, Vijay is first, and the Mrs. Gulugulu will be the second. Thank you, Hilal. Uh, and uh, wonderful to be part of this uh, great panel. Uh, I am from Andhra Pradesh, India. Uh, Andhra Pradesh is a state with a population of 54 million. And uh, we have 8 million farmers and uh, farm workers. 30% uh, of uh, this 8 million are landless farm workers, most vulnerable in terms of poverty and uh, food security. And of the farmers, 86% farmers are small and marginal farmers. Uh, average holding is one hectare. So to answer your question, climate change is definitely seen as a growing threat to food security. But at the speed with which it can engulf the food system is still not fully understood. And therefore, the solutions are seen in terms of decreasing emissions, 
increasing afforestation, the impression is that you know we have to somehow adapt to it, and uh, nothing can be done to slow it down or reverse it. Uh, but the fact that food system itself is a major cause of the greenhouse gases is still not fully understood. So in Andhra Pradesh, we took up natural farming as a way of improving farmers' livelihoods, as a way of improving food security, and as a way of restoring degraded lands. So we have you know, come to it in an indirect way. Uh, so this, what you're saying, the missing element is the link between the food system as a causative factor in climate change and the fact that food system can be a, a major solution. And uh, that is my you know, appeal because we have now more than 750,000 farmers are enrolled into natural farming and uh, they are showing that livelihoods can be improved, food security can be improved, and more important, the soil degradation can be arrested. So uh, the question still remains, Hilal, that the connection food system uh, as a causatory factor of climate change is not fully understood. So I really urge uh, the international community to bring this connection very clear so that countries have a, you know, like nationally determined contributions of food system vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate change. Thank you. Elizabeth, it's your turn. Two minutes, please. Thank you so much. You can definitely rely on young people that they'll be on time. So the problem that we normally face when it comes to agriculture policies and climate related policies is because most of the times our policies are disintegrated. Remember, if we are talking about climate change, this is a cross cutting issue. So if we are now coming up with policies, there is need for serious consultation amongst various stakeholders. The Ministry of Environment or Climate cannot decide to come up with a climate change policy and not consult the Minister of Agriculture or other relevant stakeholders, including women, the business people, young people, they all should be on board. If this does not happen, it leaves gaps. We are talking about food systems. Most continents, most countries, up to now, they do not even have any policies that are addressing to their food systems. Um, this will be very important considering that COVID-19 last year actually exposed us and it made us realize that our food systems are not resilient. And we are actually expecting that most governments should be working on coming up with policies that are addressing how we can come up with robust um, food system policies, speaking to and uh, uh, attending, addressing issues to do with, you know, how we could reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the agricultural sector, how we can reduce labor hours um, when it comes to women and gender, how we can create opportunities for young people so that they can improve on their innovations. So this is the gap that is already there. We have identified the gap and um, there's still room for improvement. From where I come from, we basically rely on agriculture for everything, but these are the things that we've started advocating for so that you can have good and robust policies and good food system policies. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very strong message for all of us, especially under the COP26. The four question we have several of speakers to answer. I'm starting from Mayor Soyer. The question is, can you tell us about the policies your city, uh, of course, in the city of Izmir regional national governments or other speakers too, is implementing to reduce the adverse impact of climate change on food systems or to create climate resilience. The floor is yours. Thank you. The food system is directly related with the agricultural production and the climate crisis directly affects the agricultural production, which means it's uh, with the floats, with draw, climate change and the climate crisis affects directly the agricultural processes. Yeah. For this reason, we have to deal with the small scale production most. And the uh, small scale production means the small farmers, the small producers, 
uh, they have to stay at their villages to continue their production so that uh, we have to uh, we have to create uh, opportunities to support them uh, and let them continue their production for this reason we are saying that another kind of agriculture is possible which means that supporting the small farmers and uh, let them produce uh, using less water, reduce the irrigation uh, systems and reduce uh, water usage and uh, let them produce uh, regarding the climate uh, uh, possibilities, which means we are uh, trying to uh, create a basin planning, which means according to uh, the uh, uh, according to the different uh, 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 priorities and according to the different uh, potentials of uh, the basins we are trying to uh, change the product design of the spacing and uh, these are uh, uh, in harmony with the rain uh, systems of the, the, the region. So they need less uh, water and we are also promoting uh, them to use new technologies for irrigation using uh, water less. So this is the basic uh, uh, priority from our point of view. And the second is we are also fighting with the poverty of uh, those uh, regions, which means we are supporting those small uh, producers, small farmers, from the seed stage until the end consumers, which means it is, from our point of view, agriculture is not only uh, starts with the land and ends there. It is a process which starts with the seed and the transportation, the, uh, creating some kind of added value to the product, logistics, branding, uh, even exporting, yeah. are all those uh, uh, process, uh, uh, co consist this process. So we are supporting this uh, producer from every stage and uh, we are trying to uh, give some kind of uh, guarantee from the municipal side. If they cannot sell their products, our municipality gives a guarantee to buy them okay. or to produce uh, uh, what, what we support uh, in the production uh, scale. So basically I have to, uh, I may stop here to, 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 to say that there are two main streams from our agricultural uh, processes. First, to, uh, let, uh, to, to let them produce uh, products in harmony with the climate and support those small producers uh, to stand on their uh, land villages. Yeah. Land. Thank you, thank you. And Ms. Mr. Ahyane Siddiq, please, uh, you can answer also the same question, but please stay in two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is about uh, city uh, government policies of how to cope with uh, the adverse of climate change. I think in, in our city, it is similar with other cities. We are using uh, like in the main uh, main rule, we, could, we, use, uh, we use a spatial planning. In the spatial planning, we require every development in the city area it should co it should uh, use the requ requirement that this is, should be in line with the goals of the uh, environment also how to uh, fulfill the livestock is it also with uh, in line with the the objective of the resilient city to mitigate in uh, disaster so in our city to cope with this uh, policies we also use and how we in the first 
first step is how we should uh, construct the water because the water in area in Surakarta in Indonesia like the climate in this climate uh, in uh, tropical climate this we have two seasons that is one one a half year with a hot rain and then one a half year is the dry season so the dry season sometimes is sorted of water and then and the hot season and the hot rainy season is full of, of um, more than water so we should uh, conserve water to the ground use a uh, regulation with uh, spatial planning with we can if we can conserve water in the ground so we can we can uh, supply for the vegetable and then for the trees and then everything also for to make a make microclimate in Surakarta more uh, more more better and then I said this is uh, the main policy in Surakarta in uh, how to face the the aspect the climate change we use uh, mainly is how to conserve the water on the ground we built in a requirement we built the many many places with a uh, shallow deep well or shallow well in 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 the in objective to maintain the water to be absorbed in the water and will be used at the dry season and it is useful to fulfill uh, the need of uh, urban farming in many many groups in Surakarta city i think the, this is the main uh, policies in our, Surak in our city thank you thank you uh, minister jorda same question the climate change and food systems how are we going to change the food system to adjust to climate change same Bueno, uh, aparte de, de que nosotros estamos, como puede ser de otra manera, trabajando para alinear uh, nuestros esfuerzos con los ODS 2030, evidentemente de Naciones Unidas y el Green Deal también de la Unión Europea, que en sus estrategias del Farm to Fork y de Biodiversidad define uh, una política agraria enmarcada por unos objetivos que son, vale decir, también muy ambiciosos en materia de medio ambiente, de lucha de cambio climático y con una clara preocupación por la conservación de los recursos. En Cataluña mmm, estamos haciendo varias cosas, pero yo creo que me gustaría poner de relieve un proyecto para nosotros muy importante, que es el proyecto de ley de la producción agraria sostenible. Uh, ahora está, hemos aprobado hace poco en gobierno la memoria preliminar, pero está caminando ya para ser una ley Y para nosotros esto será el eje básico de la producción alimentaria catalana de los próximos años. Se trata de un nuevo modelo productivo que va a permitir evaluar, a la vez también clasificar y reconocer las explotaciones agrícolas catalanas de nuestro país según su nivel de sostenibilidad. Pero lo hará, y esto es novedoso, desde una triple mmm, vertiente ambiental, vital, uh, social, importantísima, pero también, también eh, económica eh, y lo hará de forma objetiva y vale decir también uh, cuantitativa. La producción agrícola sostenible es pues para nosotros un proyecto estratégico uh, y queremos que este sistema de producción sea un referente para el sector primario que, como digo, uh, le ayude también a realizar la transición hacia modelos agrarios más sostenibles. Y en esta visión también, por lo que hace referencia al sector ganadero, que en nuestro país es muy importante, estamos trabajando en una nueva regulación de la ordenación ganadera que limite las granjas, explotaciones para fomentar el equilibrio entre sostenibilidad económica y ambiental, que puedan vivir, pero evidentemente también de una manera sostenible. ¿Eh? Y en este sentido estamos hablando de una capacidad de 600 cabezas por, por granja. Y por último, eh, en la mitigación del cambio climático, el gobierno de nuestro país cuenta, y eso también quiero ponerlo en valor, eh, con la ayuda del prestigioso eh, Instituto de Recerca y Tecnologías Alimentarias, IRTA, ¿eh? que va a desarrollar y que desarrolla una labor fundamental y que contribuye también a la vez a la modernización, a la competitividad para nosotros clave, para nuestro sector, que es un sector también pequeño en nuestro país, pero evidentemente productor de alimentos extremadamente importante y, y la competitividad es clave y para último el desarrollo sostenible también desde este Instituto de, 
de recerca de los sectores agrarios alimenticio y acuícola también. ¿eh? El abastecimiento de alimentos sanos y también trabajan en la calidad para los consumidores y en general para el bienestar de la población. Son tres elementos que para nosotros son claves en estos momentos para avanzar hacia a la mitigación del cambio climático y, la, y que el sector siga, siga vivo. Muchas gracias. And Mr. Moro de Castro, please. Um, circular economy for food uh, by supporting, uh, sorry, uh, our main um, food program in Sao Paulo is uh, called Connect the Dots. It was, it's a program that we've uh, been, we set out a few years ago. It even got the Bloomberg Philanthropies Mayor's Challenge Prize in 2019. And what it is, is uh, it's, they promote circular economy for food by supporting local farmers as they transition to regenerative practices, farming, working with nature, production of local food that builds soil health, promotes biodiversity, helps tackle climate change and reduces farmers' uh, reliance on synthetics, fertilizers and pesticides. The city of Sao Paulo also purchases from these local farmers at a 30% increase on market value. Um, integrated food systems can strengthen the regional economy by ensuring that these items su are supplied by these local farmers and uh, peri-urban growers are met by local demand. So, uh, in the, as I said in my first intervention, the south of our city, of our municipality, is covered by rural land, and it's also uh, the poorest sector in, in, in the whole of the city. Uh, so, this program, uh, not only does it promote agriculture, but it also um, gives uh, technical assistance to these local farmers uh, in order to produce sustainably, uh, organically, and for them to have income. So we're taking uh, sustainable development to the poorest region of the city. This program, uh, its first and second stages are were a success and are gone through, and now we're, we mean to institutionalize it uh, definitely as a, our, as a municipal public policy. Uh, the production and distribution chains can create or maintain local jobs in cultivation, harvesting, packaging, uh, retailing processes, which contributes to the economically led option uh, for these individuals to say, stay in environmentally protected areas of the city. The south of Sao Paulo also is, has a specific characteristic that is uh, one sixth of the whole of the territory is covered by a virgin Atlantic rainforest. So. Um, okay. it, it, never touched, it's in pristine. Uh, we also give local assistance, uh, local technical assistance to these farmers. Uh, so uh, via a uh, online platform called Sampa Mais Rural and Sis Rural, which develops, uh, which was developed to support uh, the collection of data and monitoring of actions uh, on the progress of ecological farming. So it's a, it's a public database that we monitor the agriculture activity and ecological preservation. And our other policy that is connected to this is that we have uh, each day over 800 uh, open market fairs for produce. And there's a, a lot of organic waste generated from this. And we have, we've instituted a few composting yards throughout the city where we turn this organic waste into compost. And then we redistribute it to local farmers and producers free of charge as yes. um, Thank you, natural Mr. fertilizers. Castro. Thank you very Thank much. You. And now we go again to Vijay, to in India. Uh, can you please uh, summarize in two minutes what would be the climate change and food system? Yeah. Uh, our uh, policy is to primarily improve the livelihoods of farmers, provide food and nutrition security to citizens, also to reverse migration of youth from uh, villages to cities and make agriculture a profitable occupation for them. And all this with climate change resilient practices. So that's why we have embraced natural farming or regenerative agriculture. And uh, the results are that with the help of the rural women self-help groups, close to about one and a half million women uh, are involved in this program and they in fact provide the energy for this program. So this program that we are implementing is a holistic solution from uh, to farmers livelihoods, 
because we are seeing that their uh, you know incomes are going up costs have come down they are using less water their soil is improving biodiversity is improving at the same time they are more resilient to droughts and floods so the regenerative agriculture that we are you know uh, taking forward through women self help groups and the champion farmers is producing very beneficial results for the farmers at the same time the consumers are getting good quality food but uh, most important is we are seeing biodiversity returning we are seeing the you know soil water uh, improving so the vision of our government is can be uh, may take this to all the farmers and farm workers in the state and that is the vision we are working on and uh, we are also uh, in the drought prone areas how can regenerative agriculture help farmers there to be resilient to droughts and also uh, you know be able to produce uh, better food even in spite of very low rainfall uh, so i'll stop here thank you thank you and uh, this question is just for Ms. Glugul. Uh, what are the key messages of young people on food systems and climate and how can cities, regional and national governments better listen to and include the voice of youth? Because you already mentioned the importance. Now you should ask them what to do to include you. Thank you so much for the question food systems are not only about equality but they are also about equity we need to come up with an inclusive approach whereby we put everyone on board including those with disabilities so if we are coming up with all these policies we need to make sure that we are using an inclusive approach we need to make sure that as we are coming up with sustainable or waking up working on coming up with sustainable food systems a food system is not sustainable if it's in violation of our environment. So as long as we are practicing our agriculture, as long as we are working on improving our produce and we are using a lot of chemicals, we are using fertilizers, that food system per se is not sustainable. Because number one, it starts from the soil. If we violate the nature's, if we violate the laws of nature, by putting different kinds of chemicals in our soils, it also means that even the quality of our foods is not healthy and it's not sustainable. So this is what we call upon. Uh, when it comes to access to water, I mean, uh, on the panel, someone was talking about, you know, how they are addressing water challenges. Precision agriculture is very, very important to practice. We need to make sure that we are reducing uh, food waste Food waste also plays a role in greenhouse gas emissions. Pre, prior and after that, all those should be addressed. So as a call to young people, a call from young people, basically what you are saying is for us to come up with sustainable food systems, there's also the need of financial flows to support and upscale even farmers that are working on transitioning. We have farmers that have been practicing their agriculture, not in a more sustainable way, but are willing to transition in a more sustainable way, maybe using uh, and paying particular attention to agroecological practices. Those resources should be available. Those resources should be easily accessible because having resources available and them being accessible, these are two different things. So all those stumbling blocks should be removed. And yeah, I think that's why I can Thank say. you. Thank you, Ms. Kulugula. It was a very good answer and we should really think about it. The, this question for uh, Mayor uh, Soyer, uh, we already mentioned uh, the importance of the climate change of smallholder farmers. Uh, what policies are implemented for vulnerable groups to be resilient against climate change in relation to access to affordable food? This time, the resilience uh, part of the society, not only smallholder farmers, but all the poverty uh, policies yeah. in relation to climate change. I would like to mention two projects. Yeah. One is people groceries, something like supermarkets, but not a supermarket. Yeah. They can only sell uh, the producers' cooperatives' products. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, without the intermediaries, they produce, and as the municipality, we give some kind of logistic support and they bring their products and we sell only the cooperatives products. Mm -hmm. This is also something good for the citizens, which they can see, yes. they can buy healthy and affordable and fair uh, products. The second uh, project is uh, local farmers markets, mm -hmm. which means uh, this is an open air market and we give also logistic support to the producers. They bring their products, we give their stands and we mm -hmm. give their uh, whatever they need to, to, to market their products and uh, they sell it to the citizens again without any kind of intermediaries. Mm -hmm. Which is which those two projects give a kind of uh, self confidence to the producers mm -hmm. and uh, they directly find markets for their products. And it's also good for the citizens because they may buy uh, with an affordable price a uh, very variety uh, of uh, different products. Mm -hmm. So those two small projects change their uh, attitudes and they try to produce more uh, and different uh, products. These are two uh, small projects, but affect their daily lives. And also, of course, uh, healthy food, which yes. is uh, accessible and affordable, which is very important yeah. thing. And big cities, they are the problems. Now we, we are a little running late, uh, but we have a final question for all panelists. You have maximum one minute. So what is your vision? That's an important, I, cannot, I, I cannot really make my vision in one minute, but I want you from your vision for reaching 2050, first 2030 because sustainable development goals, and then 2050, what will be the vision for the food system? What no, needs to be in place? I'm starting from uh, Mrs. Kuludulu and we go like that. You have one minute. Thank Maximum. you so much. Uh, basically my vision will be to have resilient food systems that are inclusive of all, it's all about inclusivity. If we are now talking about the SDGs, then we are not supposed to leave anyone behind. And SDG goal number 17 talks about the importance of partnerships. So if we're saying we want them to be inclusive, we also should make sure that we also um, we also consider you know consider partnering with different stakeholders, the private sector, the, the NGOs, the young people, the women, the government, so that we can come up with resilient food systems. Thank you, uh, Minister. This is your. En 50, en 50 segundos, a ver si es posible. Desde el gobierno de Cataluña pues no definimos mucho. De hecho, lo que queremos, lo que tenemos claro es que luchamos para tener un sistema agroalimentario catalán sostenible, transformador y sobre todo basado en la circular. Atent, uh, queremos también, lo entendemos, um, que, sea, que atienda bien a la mitigación y a la adaptación de la emergencia climática, pero también que preserve y de alguna manera restablezca también los recursos sobre los que depende el sistema alimentario. Esto es, es clave. Y también queremos que sea dinámico, dinámico y sobre todo que genere valor. También lo queremos propio. ¿eh? Uh, el modelo catalán agroalimentario lo tenemos muy claro, es el modelo familiar y pequeño, ¿eh? que evidentemente tiene que seguir, uh, digamos, uh, uh, avanzando al lado de otro modelo que también existe evidentemente pero decía que lo queremos um, propio y arraigado al territorio ¿eh? que garantice sobre todo la cohesión territorial y también el, arra el arraigo a las poblaciones rurales de nuestro país así como y acabo que refuerce la autoestima alimentaria también en nuestro país Thank you uh, Mayor Sawyer, what is your vision for 2050? 
uh, <clears throat> first of all, as I mentioned, we are looking for another kind of agriculture, which supports the small scale production. Because it, uh, if uh, the, the poverty increase in those uh, rural areas, then the balance of the society changes. Yeah. So to keep this balance uh, fruitful for the whole parties, we have to support the small scale production, the small farmers. But this is not the only, uh, the only way. We let them become exporters with their uh, products. So we are trying to give uh, support in all those uh, uh, stages of the production. But this is not enough. We have to be in uh, solidarity with the other organizations such as the Chamber of Commerce of the region, the, the Commodity Exchange, the industrial chambers, but this is also not enough. We have to be in contact with the NGOs of uh, the international NGOs, which shows us way, for example, the ICLEI, yeah. the Snow Food Organization, because uh, all those uh, problems which are created from the climate crisis should be solved in solidarity and hand in hand. By the way, I would like to invite all the Terra Madre organization in uh, September next year, which they will uh, be the host uh, in Izmir. And uh, we will let uh, the, the, the world uh, gastronomy uh, meet each other and show uh, each other and inspire each other for the methods of production and the ways of uh, producing uh, products in harmony with climate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the open invitation. Hopefully we will see all together in next September in Izmir, the beautiful city. And uh, please, Mr. De Sousa, uh, De Castro, um, São Paulo's vision uh, for 2050 and 2030 is that um, agricultural systems can continue to thrive and we can produce more food without cutting another single tree. This is the vision of São Paulo for its own territory, but also for Brazil. Brazil is a major uh, agricultural producer and uh, with increased precision farming, with um, intensive farming, we can continue to produce and produce even more without uh, deforestation. This is specifically important for Sao Paulo because, as I said, our rural region is uh, half of it is covered by native Atlantic rainforest. So this is very important for us. And we're working uh, with our agricultural uh, small farmers like in Izmir and Catalonia to um, teach them uh, via technical uh, assistance and also education. We've got a, a, uni a university for environmental protection and co uh, promotion of peace which also educates people in Sao Paulo to uh, produce and, and pr produce conscientiously and, pr and protect the environment. So this is what we uh, feel and I hope everyone agrees is what we need to have in place definitely by 2030 and start uh, to get the results in 2050. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Kumar, right now your vision for 2030 and 2050. Thank you. I believe that transformation of food system is critical for reversing climate change. And this can be done primarily by the farmers, women, essentially in our country, small and marginal farmers, indigenous communities, and youth. It is knowledge intensive agriculture, it is also a form of agriculture which is mimicking nature. So it's in harmony with nature, no synthetic chemicals. So this kind of uh, system not only improves livelihoods, provides good food, but most important, enhances resilience to climate change. And I believe very strongly it can reverse climate change. So my vision is that by 2030, all our farmers, farm workers transform their methods of production 
and by 2050 we should have reverse climate change so that's my vision and we are already 20 years late for that so we should you know work doubly fast thank you thank you thank you very much uh, i don't see mr ahyani siddiq still is with us i'm not sure okay now uh, should i bring the, all our panelists to the floor or they could stay here Okay, for the question and answer, I will be here. Now we have, uh, we are a little late, not very little, but we'll try to fi uh, fit in. Now we have interventions from Glasgow Declaration signatories, and we have maximum, very maximum, two minutes for our signatory uh, representative of cities and sub-national places. The first one in my list will be virtual Audrey Pulvar, Deputy Mayor of Paris. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Very pleased to be with you uh, uh, today. Je vais continuer en français puisque je vous parle de Paris. Je suis effectivement adjointe à, à la maire de Paris, Anne Hidalgo, qui était à Glasgow uh, avec uh, la maire de, de Glasgow il y, a, il y a quelques jours encore pour la, pour la, pour la COP. Euh, Paris est engagé depuis euh, plusieurs années euh, dans, euh, dans euh, une démarche de développement euh, d'un système alimentaire qui soit durable, inclus inclusif, euh, résilient. Et euh, il est très important pour nous, hein, un des euh, intervenants le signalait euh, tout à l'heure, il est très important pour nous que euh, toute la, la population euh, parisienne, toutes celles et ceux qui ont euh, l'usage de Paris, qu'ils soient parisiens ou pas, euh, euh, au quotidien, euh, eh bien, est accès à une alimentation euh, de qualité et ce, euh, quel que soit euh, leur revenu. Euh, je considère que l'agriculture et l'alimentation sont des secteurs extrêmement euh, importants euh, dans la transition euh, écologique et solidaire qu'il nous faut euh, engager. Et évidemment, ce sont aussi euh, des secteurs de grandes inégalités, donc il nous faut euh, bien sûr... Euh, euh, envisager ces questions et les politiques publiques menées euh, euh, sur ces sujets, d'abord à travers le prisme de la lutte contre les inégalités. Rapprocher euh, les lieux de production agricole, de transformation, de consommation, c'est évidemment un, un enjeu majeur euh, que nous prenons à bras le corps euh, dans, dans la ville de Paris. Nous avons déjà euh, euh, multiplié par trois euh, en six ans euh, les surfaces agricoles euh, cultivées dans Paris intramuros, mais bien sûr l'agriculture en ville, l'agriculture urbaine, c'est un tout petit maillon de la chaîne euh, pour nourrir la, la, la population euh, parisienne. Donc l'enjeu aussi pour nous et pour moi euh, qui est euh, la responsabilité, la charge de la délégation à l'agriculture, à l'alimentation durable et au circuit court de proximité, l'enjeu c'est bien sûr d'accompagner fortement euh, avec notamment le levier de la commande publique, d'accompagner la transition agricole de l'ensemble euh, du territoire euh, qui est autour de Paris et qui, euh, qui nourrit, qui va nourrir de plus en plus Paris, euh, c'est-à-dire l'île de France, et puis dans un rayon de 250 km autour de Paris, vraiment accompagner euh, la transition euh, euh, agricole du territoire vers des méthodes agricoles moins prédatrices pour l'environnement, plus rémunératrices pour les, les agriculteurs c'est-à-dire entre autres l'agroécologie, la conforesterie, la permaculture, soutenir, encourager la polyculture élevage afin que euh, nos agricultrices et nos agriculteurs aient un revenu décent, garanti, et en même temps que euh, nos euh, consommateurs parisiens aient accès, que ce soit euh, à travers la restauration collective ou, ou la restauration commerciale, à une alimentation euh, de la plus grande qualité. Je voulais juste rapidement rajouter que euh, nous sommes aujourd'hui dans la restauration collective parisienne à 53% de bio ou durable et que l'objectif qui est double, qui m'est fixé par la maire de Paris, c'est de passer à 100% de bio durable, dont 50% proviendront de moins de 250 km de Paris. Le rôle des villes est évidemment particulièrement important quand il s'agit d'accompagner la transition écologique et solidaire, y compris sur les secteurs d'agriculture et de l'alimentation. Et donc nous sommes très, très honorés et très fiers d'avoir signé la déclaration de Glasgow et d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Merci à toutes et tous. Sorry, I'm very sorry, but I don't want to interrupt you, but... It is not going to be fair, other speakers. Yes, I understand. 
Good. Please keep Thank it you. two minutes. And now we are going to virtual again to Madagascar. Are we? You are with us, uh, Mandresi Rakotorison, Director of International Cooperation, Antana Narivo. Please, floor is yours. Thank you for uh, giving me the floor. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Mandres Rakotorison. I am the Director of International Cooperation for the city of Tana, uh, as we call it. Uh, I am speaking here on behalf of the mayor uh, as we as part of one of the signatory cities of the Declaration of Glasgow and uh, as a member of the steering committee of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Uh, congratulations to all the signatory cities on launching the Declaration of Glasgow last year. And the uh, meeting here today, a year later, uh, it truly really displays our commitment and common engagement. And thank you to IPAS Food for, uh, for having us here. Uh, the mayor of Antananarivo is uh, firmly engaged in transforming uh, Tana into a green city, uh, which includes the development of uh, sustainable food systems. And the initiative of a green city for us is a key component in our fight against climate change. Uh, it includes in the improvement of uh, governance in terms of municipal markets, better food waste management, and the development of public gardens and uh, botanical parks. School canteens as well for public uh, primary schools along with vegetable gardens. And we're also starting cap capacity building activities for the citizens uh, to multiply agricultural initiatives and to sensibilize on food systems. Food can be a driver for development and uh, building resilience in city food systems implies integrated and adapted food production systems. And the resilience approach is so necessary to ensure consistency of actions and to create synergy between actors and create multiple response mechanisms. Uh, the de Declaration of Glasgow represents for us a major platform to advocate for a better implication of uh, local authorities in discussions and in the decision-taking process regarding the development of food and alimentary policies with international, national, and regional bodies. As the work to achieve the sustainable development goals directly imp implies us local authorities. Thank you. Much now we have in person the presentation from Marseille. Please, uh, uh, Jean Charles Lardic, the floor is yours. Thanks. Mesdames et Messieurs, j'interviens au nom du maire de Marseille, Monsieur Benoît Payan, et de Madame Aïcha Sif, en charge de l'alimentation durable, qui était euh, son adjointe, qui était à Barcelone il y a 15 jours. Je remercie tout d'abord les municipalités de Milan, de Barcelone, de Glasgow, qui nous ont encouragés depuis cinq ans à nous mobiliser autour de l'alimentation durable. Pour nous, la transition alimentaire croise toutes nos politiques territoriales. Elle est au cœur d'un projet de transformation sociétale qui garantira, qui garantira la résilience de nos territoires et de nos sociétés avec la participation de tous les citoyens. En relançant l'agriculture urbaine, nous portons les germes de nouveaux modèles de développement local, plus sobres, plus justes, qui contribueront aussi à la lutte contre le changement climatique. Nous sommes ici pour témoigner de cette conviction auprès des États, des États trop focalisés sur une vision technologique, énergétique, au point d'avoir oublié d'inscrire l'alimentation dans leur feuille de route la plupart du temps et d'avoir oublié d'inscrire cette transformation sociétale également. En soutenant le pacte alimentaire de Milan, en signant la déclaration de Glasgow, en adhérant au Barcelona Challenge, nous voulons nous adresser aux États pour leur demander de prendre en compte les objectifs de transition alimentaire et plus largement de, de transition sociétale dans leur feuille de route, d'y contribuer par de nouveaux accords internationaux sur l'agriculture et le commerce, d'adapter les instruments financiers en faveur du climat au soutien des politiques systémiques et transformatrices qui accompagnent les politiques d'alimentation durable, de clarifier la gouvernance territoriale de l'alimentation et enfin, pour conclure, d'associer les collectivités territoriales et leurs réseaux à la gouvernance mondiale de l'environnement en favorisant une transition 
juridique global indispensable à l'émergence d'une créativité territoriale portée par de nouveaux modèles économiques et qui soutiendront des transitions vertueuses nous menant vers des villes plus justes, plus vertes et plus démocratiques. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marseille. Now we have another uh, mayor, from, deputy mayor, uh, Gilles Perrault, uh, Mohan Sarto from France, virtual. Well, our meeting. Bonjour, merci uh, de votre invitation. Euh, depuis dix ans, à Montsartou, les, les enfants des, des écoles et des crèches mangent 100% bio. Et même depuis deux ans, les enfants du collège nous ont rejoints grâce à la demande des enfants. Ce qui fait de Montsartou la seule ville de France où l'on mange 100% bio de 0 à 15 ans. Et on sait que c'est bon pour leur santé et pour le climat. Quand on demande à des élus pourquoi ils ne servent pas plus de bio à leur cantine, ils nous répondent souvent que c'est trop cher. À Montsartou, nous avons montré que l'on est passé à la cantine 100% bio à budget constant, en diminuant de 80% le gaspillage alimentaire et en servant deux repas végétariens chaque semaine. Ces deux actions cumulées euh, offrent une opportunité de diminuer de 30% le coût de revient d'un repas, ce qui permet de financer l'achat de produits bio de meilleure qualité. Ainsi, grâce au triptyque vertueux bio, diminution du gaspillage alimentaire et diversification des sources de protéines, les enfants bénéficient d'une alimentation favorable à l'environnement et à la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique. Les élus opposent aussi au développement du bio un deuxième frein, qui est le manque d'approvisionnement local. Là encore, Monsartou a eu une solution en créant une ferme municipale où trois agriculteurs salariés de la commune produisent 96 des légumes bio que mangent les enfants à la cantine, mais aussi en triplant les surfaces agricoles et en aidant, en aidant les agriculteurs à, en bio à s'installer sur la commune. Pour lutter contre le réchauffement climatique, relocaliser l'agriculture n'est pas suffisant. Il faut l'associer à des pratiques biologiques et agroécologiques pour avoir un effet positif sur l'environnement et le réchauffement climatique. Je voudrais vous adresser trois vœux. Le premier, c'est que l'agriculture locale est une réponse insuffisante si elle n'est pas associée à des modes de pratiques agricoles, biologiques et agrologiques. C'est pourquoi le terme « alimentation durable » doit être mieux défini pour être sûr qu'il réponde aux enjeux climatiques. Cette définition partagée pourrait servir de base aux différents textes réglementaires et notamment à la politique agricole commune en Europe. Le deuxième vœu, c'est que la COP prenne, on voit que les COP prennent des engagements mais les collectivités territoriales que nous sommes, mettons-nous en œuvre des actions concrètes. C'est pourquoi les gouvernements doivent plus nous soutenir dans l'innovation que nous menons sur nos territoires, dans les actions et dans le partage des réussites. Et le troisième vœu pour conclure, c'est que les gouvernements doivent aussi faire évoluer les règles qui bloquent le changement. C'est pourquoi Monsartou propose la mise en place d'une exception alimentaire dans le Code des marchés publics pour faciliter l'achat public auprès des producteurs locaux. Je vous remercie. Now we have a uh, councillor, uh, Ms. Asher Craig uh, from Bristol. Uh, she'll be virtually with us also. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this incredibly important event today. Bristol is one of the leading food cities in the United Kingdom, but firmly believes in the importance of action to tackle the climate emergency through sustainable integrated food policy. And we join the call on national governments to share our ambition. As a city, we have been working towards a healthy and sustainable food system for over a decade, including being awarded silver food sustainability status in 2016. But our declarations in 2018 of a climate emergency and in 2020 of an ecological emergency formalized the integration of our food and climate policies through the resulting strategies, including a number of key food targets. 
Bristol is working together with city partners from across a huge range of public, private, voluntary and third sector partners. We call this the One City Approach. Together we share an aim to make Bristol a fair, healthy and sustainable city, which is never more important than now with the challenges we collectively face. Through our One City Approach, the city collectively agreed that we should prioritise ambition, our ambition, to make Bristol's food system better for our people, our city and the planet. Collectively, we called this Bristol Going for Gold, which the City Council coordinated along with Partners, Bristol Food Network, Bristol Green Capital Partnership and Resources Future. In June of this year, we were delighted to be awarded the prestigious status of Gold Sustainable Food City. Bristol is the only second city in the UK to achieve such an award from the independent sustainable food places. Bristol's political will combined with our partnership of stakeholders was a key part of our success in winning gold. Our application focused on the themes of reducing food waste, supporting community action, growing Bristol's good food movement, fostering a resilient local food economy, increasing urban food growing, eating better and promoting food equality. The citywide partnership initiative contributes to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number two, three, 12 and 15, and to our own local vision of a fair and inclusive city where everyone has access to healthy, ethical and sustainably produced food alongside work to address the climate in ecological emergencies. We now want to go further to build on what we have achieved so far and as we re recover from the impacts of COVID to help achieve a decade of transformation through food to 2030. This includes working together with our city partners and our citizens to develop our food equality strategy and action plan so that everyone in our city has reliable access to nutritious and affordable food and that the people growing and producing our food receive a fair income. We also welcome the work towards the national food strategy in the United Kingdom, the independent review of food systems setting out how diets will need to change over the next decade to help the government's targets on health, climate and nature. And we hope that this will continue with the recommendation for a good food bill to help drive wider action as part of a multilateral approach. In Bristol, leadership on food policy is decentralized and priorities are aligned vertically and horizontally across the city, from the mayor and councillors to all community stakeholders. Bristol looks forward to learning from and sharing its experience in this regard with other Glasgow Declaration signatory cities. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for good words. And now we have in-person participation, Mayor Gorka Urtaran from Basque Country, please. Thank you. Mr. Evil. Good morning, everybody. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. En primer lugar, quiero agradecer el trabajo que han hecho todas las personas para la redacción y la firma de esta importante declaración en este fantástico ayuntamiento y en este contexto de la COP26. Vitoria Gasteiz es una ciudad que está en el norte del Estado español y está reconocida por sus políticas medioambientales. Somos capital verde europea, como Bristol, como Oslo, como Copenhague o también como Estocolmo. Y somos una ciudad verde global porque así fuimos reconocidos en 2019 por Naciones Unidas Habitat. Pero cuando hablamos del sistema agroalimentario también sufrimos los mismos problemas que sufren otras ciudades de Europa y del mundo la falta de relevo generacional, eh, la pérdida de la producción hortícola frutal eh, y el concentrar toda la producción en el cereal, en nuestro caso, colocándolo en los mercados nacionales o internacionales, está generando una política muy diferente a lo que debe ser una política de consumo local y sostenible. Vitoria destina prácticamente la tercera parte de su superficie al cultivo y eso supuesto, bueno, por aproximadamente supone dos veces lo que ocupa el lago Ness aquí en Escocia. Además, la crisis de la COVID-19 nos ha demostrado que no podemos generar esta huella de carbono que genera el actual sistema con un 25-30% de las emisiones procedentes del sistema agroalimentario y que la crisis de los suministros no puede afectar a la alimentación. 
Por eso es muy importante la firma de hoy. And last but not least, I would like to share with all of you a message. Victoria Gasteiz will always engage uh, with that kind of initiatives to save our planet, our cities, and our lives in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going back again, I think virtual. Uh, this is from Lyon, our participants, Gautier Chapu, Deputy Mayor in charge of local food and food safety in Lyon. Floor is yours. Bonjour à toutes et tous. D'abord, merci de cette invitation. Um, il était... Uh, euh, pour nous, à Lyon, incontournable de signer cette euh, déclaration. Et euh, au nom du maire de Lyon, Grégory Doucet, euh, je me félicite et je nous félicite de cette, de cette matinée-là. Alors, on a l'habitude de dire que Lyon est une, une capitale de, de la gastronomie. Euh, c'est vrai, et pourtant, c'est un, une ville euh, au, au pied d'argile, puisque avec 520 000 habitants et 1,4 million sur la métropole, il ne nous reste que 5% de ce qui est produit sur la métropole qui reste sur la métropole. Et sur la ville de Lyon, contrairement à Sao Paulo, où un tiers du territoire est agricole, si j'ai bien compris, il ne nous reste chez nous que 6 hectares de terres agricoles. Donc, nous sommes obligés de faire avec d'autres collectivités et autour de nous. Et cela est très important pour la résilience de notre territoire. C'est un enjeu de relocaliser notre alimentation, de faire en sorte d'avoir une alimentation de qualité bio et j'y tiens euh, et locale. Euh, C'est également un enjeu en fait de justice, euh, de justice sociale parce que euh, sur notre métropole, 30% des, des personnes euh, se déclarent en précarité alimentaire et 15% euh, se déclarent euh, ne pas manger à leur faim. Euh, donc l'alimentation, c'est un enjeu climatique, c'est un enjeu de justice sociale et c'est un enjeu économique qui, qui nous tient à cœur surtout dans cette ville qui est, liée, qui est liée à la gastronomie. Nous travaillons sur la restauration scolaire avec un, un projet ambitieux de, de porter à 100% bio d'ici 4 ans l'alimentation dans nos, dans nos cantines et 50% en local avec un travail filière par filière pour avoir à la fois du lait, de la viande, mais aussi du maraîchage et du céréal local. Voilà, vous l'avez compris, c est, c est, ça rejoint aussi beaucoup de choses qui ont été dites ce matin et, euh, et je, je me félicite que Lyon euh, fasse partie de, de cette grande famille de villes au travers le, le monde qui, qui défendent l'alimentation et les systèmes alimentaires comme un enjeu également climatique. Je vous remercie. Thank you, thank you very much. Now uh, we have another virtual participant, this time from Nigeria. A chairman Abdul Razak Mohammed of the Okena City. Welcome. Please start. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Abdul Razak Mohammed Yusuf, deputy chairman of the local Kogi State in Nigeria. In the name of God, the most merciful. It is a real privilege and honor to be part of this great gathering in Glasgow, Scotland, via Zoom platform. My, to, to add my voice to the ongoing summit on food and climate change declaration. Climate change, we know, is a global phenomenon of climate transformation by the changes in the usual climate of the planet regarding temperature precipitation and wind, and that are especially caused by human activities. These human activities, such as the release of carbon, other fossil fuel to the atmosphere, threatens the ecosystem and causes instability in the global economy. In fact, the global warming refers to the rise in global concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In the Kenya local government of Nigeria, the administration recognized the fact that the crowd, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed the fragile of our food system, thereby causing undue increase in price of food items in the people and the rural population. The government, through various programs, made 
concerted effort to absorb the shock and ensure the economy is not collapsed. We acknowledge that food system currently accounts for 21.7% of the total greenhouse causes. Therefore, it is figured what major challenges today, including loss of Dr. Rezak, uh, I am very sorry, but we can't translate you, we can't hear. So we're going to make it, uh, maybe if we can manage, manage later, we will not be able to hear your uh, comments. So let's make it later if we make the technical difficulty solving. I'm very sorry. So now we are going into the question. I'm, we have two, three more cities, including my own city, but I am putting myself very big. And then a question and answer period uh, for our uh, panels, uh, speakers, and possibly also uh, intervention from the Glasgow Declaration signatories. Any question, very simple, very short, and answers will be very short too. Is there any question to our panelists that we can come? Okay, uh, maybe it is better not to, uh, put the question answer period right now because uh, our uh, concluding uh, speech uh, uh, very important uh, for us to uh, uh, Miss Shona Robinson is here and he's going to give us a concluding speech something wrong huh? Sorry, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm totally made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> Council is a clear Susan Aitken, leader of Glasgow City, which we are here because of her support of declaration and her leadership of the Glasgow City Council that made City Food Plan and they are hosting us here. We are very pleased, and I'm very sorry about the mistake. Uh, we invite her to the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And first of all, can I apologize for this belated welcome? It obviously would ordinarily come at the beginning of your session, but I was at a meeting this morning um, in Glasgow Caledonian University um, of the World Health Organization on climate change as a determinant of health. And of course, food is the point where climate change and health perhaps really come together. So it's appropriate, I think, that we've linked from, uh, from wider health uh, issues into, into food as we come here. Um, so it's my very great pleasure and honour to welcome you to Glasgow, the proud host city of COP26, but even more perhaps um, the, the name that is given to the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration. And we're very proud that um, that declaration, which will of course have an impact and a life far longer than just the 12 days of these climate negotiations, um, will bear the name of our city. And that is one of the, the legacies for Glasgow uh, that we have been very proud to be part of, of shaping and hope to continue to partner and shape over the years ahead. It, in, it, it encapsulates many of the issues uh, that we have particularly focused on as a city in our somewhat bumpy and delayed journey to COP26. And most of those, uh, 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 most important of those is that climate justice and social justice are absolutely indivisible and that our net zero transition must be a just transition. Glasgow's post-industrial transition in the 1970s and 80s 
was the opposite of a just transition. It was unfair and unjust. And we live with the legacies of that to this day. Our post-carbon transition must be a just one and it must have people and communities at its heart. And the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration for me really encapsulates that spirit and those principles. When my administration uh, first came into power in Glasgow in 2017, food very quickly became a key priority for us. And it was driven, first of all, by the impact of uh, policies, economic and social welfare policies of the United Kingdom government, which had pushed more of our citizens into food poverty and insecurity probably since any time uh, since the, the Second World War in this country, actually. So we were very keen to look at what we could do as a local authority, as a city government, to support our citizens who were living in food poverty and to try and give them dignity and resilience as we responded to that. But the more we worked on the issue of food in the city, we, the more we realised uh, how closely it was linked to climate change and to the climate emergency, and the more it became part and parcel of our wider work to address the climate emergency in the city and to build a truly sustainable Glasgow for the future, and indeed to become a net zero city by 2030. And all of that work led to our Glasgow City Food Plan, uh, which was published this summer in partnership uh, with many partners who are in the room um, and which forms the, the bedrock of the work that we plan to do on food security, tackling food poverty and addressing the climate emergency over the coming years. Its principles are about being local, about being sustainable, about being community led. Um, it is helping us to reclaim the much of the vacant and derelict land in the city, which is the most visible legacy and one of the most visible urban blights that was left from that unjust legacy of deindustrialization uh, de 40 years ago. And it has dignity and uh, um, resilience and security for our communities absolutely at its heart. The other thing that is so resonant for me about the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration is, is what this, uh, this host city zone that we have been uh, um, holding in and we are very proud to host in our, um, our subtle and understated city chambers here um, over the period of COP, it, what the host city zone is all about. And it is about action delivered by sub-national and non-state actors. And that is where the real action is. It is deli being delivered by regions, by states, by cities, by municipalities, by civil society, by communities. That is where the real climate action is being delivered. It's been delivered before now, and it will continue to be delivered, regardless of what happens um, at those global negotiations just a mile from here. And without permission from those national leaders, it is... Um, local governments and the citizens that they represent who have been leading real action on climate change and who will continue to do so in the months and years ahead. And that is very, also very much encapsulated in the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration. It is about local action to deliver both local and global solutions for sustainability and for food resilience for people all across the world. A, a, a shift from a world where too many people don't know where their next meal is coming from, where too many people live with the threat, not only of hunger, but of starvation and famine on a daily basis. If we are to have a truly just transition to a post-carbon world, and if COP26 is to deliver that, then that must be at the heart of it, giving people uh, some confidence and some surety in the future uh, that food, the, the very stuff of life, um, will be something that they can rely on just as we uh, move towards um, um, 
addressing the, the loss and damage that the poorest people in the world are facing from the climate emergency right now. So everything that's being discussed here today, um, I think it couldn't be more pertinent, couldn't be more important uh, to the overall themes and the overall outcomes that we want to achieve from COP26. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I know those of you who have traveled internationally um, and, and from cities around the world, and, and I would like to extend a particular welcome to my fellow uh, city and, and local government leaders who have come from around the world. Um, I know that some of you may well have had challenging journeys to get here. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful to you for joining us here in Glasgow. Um, I apologize for the weather that we have for the big climate march today. Um, it is climate climate change in action. Um, it is underlining the reasons why we're all here. I hope that you have um, a warm sweater and something waterproof with you if you're planning to take part in the climate march at any point. Um, I'll be heading off shortly to, to join colleagues um, and to take part in that march. And hopefully the world leaders will see us in numbers and will respond to our shared voice on what we need them to deliver for the future of humanity and for the future of our planet. Thank you for being here and welcome to Glasgow. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Councillor uh, Aitken. Uh, it was uh, it, before, her support in every stage of uh, declaration was very important. We all felt that all the signatories of the declaration. So uh, we are very grateful to come to the point and we would like to go to COP27 with your support and uh, uh, encouragement that making even network is much bigger. Now I am going back again, our network cities. And in my list, uh, there is uh, one, Brighton and Ho. Uh, I am not sure in person or virtual. Please, floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. It's an absolute honor uh, to be here. And we come together during a pivotal moment for change with a shared hope for action. I'm delighted to celebrate local leadership on sustainable foods because we can show change is not only possible, it's already happening. And to drive systemic change in our global food system, it needs to be done from the ground up. My own city of Brighton and Hove is joined by cities across the world. And while we look to world leaders for action on the climate crisis, as we've all heard today, in fact, really tackling climate breakdown and inequality is happening at a local level. Local governments are responding to this crisis in a way that if mirrored on the national and international stage would see us in a much stronger position to avert climate breakdown. Everyday local cities are leading the way and resetting the balance through positive action. It's our work on food systems that is getting to the very heart of inequality, addressing the health of our communities, creating the kind of future we all want to see secured over the Clyde at COP26. And it's because we're harnessing the passion, the power, the creativity of our own communities. I'm accompanied here today by the fantastic Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, which works with us to halt the devastation of food poverty, bring dignity back to our communities and restore our relationship with food to tackle our carbon emissions. Brighton & Hove was the first city in the UK to win gold sustainable food, reflecting our trailblazing approach while the city can lay claim to some outstanding achievements, particularly in the face of the pandemic. At the height of the first lockdown, our emergency food network supported 3,200 adults and 1,300 children with food parcels, bringing together charities, local authorities, businesses, and community groups, we are tackling some of the biggest issues. And just last week, our council initiated another round of support for local food banks and community centers. This is about supporting those isolating from COVID and working with our black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities to reach those in need as well. 
The council also now has employed a dedicated food policy official to drive this agenda through all of our work. The work in the city shows we can transition from the supermarket logistics and storage giants dominating and having a negative effect on our health and our environment. And instead, surplus food charities and farmers, alongside donations from local businesses and residents, can ensure that even those in low income households have access to fresh local food within their budget. The city also has more than 70 community gardens and orchards, helping people connect with nature and get outdoors. Local chefs lead community cookery classes, while local planning rules establish space for food growing to eat local and eat well. The Glasgow Declaration reminds us, therefore, that food is at the very heart of our relationship with nature. Without a diverse, bountiful environment, already fragile food supplies will, will fail us in ways scientists have warned will be disastrous. If we are to truly see change at COP26, we need world leaders to listen, to transform land use, to cap emissions from food and farming, and to realize that the solution of so many of our problems lies in support for local communities. And this is so important, as we all know, because a whole third of toxic carbon emissions are from food production, farming, logistics. Brighton Hove is proud to be part of this conversation, to keep trying to lead the action, to work with everyone here to create a sustainable food system. We come together through the Glasgow Declaration to drive down emissions, to create healthier cities and a fairer planet for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you for Brighton and Hove leadership in terms of sustainable uh, food system. They were the first and they were the leadership still. And now we have a uh, city of Dundee, uh, Mrs. Anne Randall from Scotland. Please come to the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to do a slightly late intervention from Dundee. <clears throat> My city of Dundee on the east coast of Scotland, um, in common with our big brother, as I like to think of it, of Glasgow, has some areas of serious multiple deprivation. And COVID saw us formalizing our in informal food security networks, food insecurity networks, which already existed to help our most vulnerable cit citizens. We signed the Glasgow Declaration as a step on our journey to become one of the UK's sustainable food places. We're working locally to achieve shorter, more sustainable supply chains and food is integrated into our city plan. We're also expanding community growing projects, building stronger and more empowered communities and supporting projects focusing on food poverty. So thank you again for allowing me a few minutes of your time. And I would just like to echo the delegates from Bristol and Victoria and others, Brighton and Hove, in hoping that we can all share best practice as we work to save the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Randall. Uh, now I am representing my city of Istanbul. Uh, we are one of the early signatures of the declaration. And this declaration really helped us internally how to uh, make much more uh, active, how to be more active in relation to climate change and food security system. That is a very clear impact of the uh, the declaration that you can see in Istanbul, we prepared uh, the food policy uh, paper uh, for the uh, Istanbul municipality, and the principles are completely followed by the uh, Glasgow Declaration and Milan uh, City Pact. 
and we open right now to public to make much more democratic now uh, this all the uh, principles that we all know in this uh, area in in this uh, room uh, open to turkish uh, istanbul uh, people uh, to understand and support if they have any kind of criticism also open it to make it much more active, democratic and participatory. And we are ready to make it all the networking even larger because we have also internally social democrats, municipalities, which Izmir is one of the uh, members. Uh, then all these metropolitan mayors work on the support these principles. Thank you for this two minutes. And now uh, I am giving the floor to uh, Barcelona, Maria Carascosa, because recently there was a meeting uh, in Barcelona. Maybe she will give us uh, some kind of uh, the current uh, situation on that. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, I am going to present you in one minute the Barcelona Challenge for Good Food and, and Climate, which has been the political outcome, as Hilda, she was saying, of the seventh global forum of the Milan Pact that was held uh, two weeks ago from the 19th to the 21st of October in Barcelona, and where more than 100 cities participate, more than 60, 600 participants were there virtually and, and uh, on site. And as I said, this, was a, this has been the, the political outcome because the theme of the seventh global, global forum was uh, developing resilient food systems to tackle the climate emergency. So this Barcelona challenge for good food and climate, it's uh, a commitment of cities with the support of their residents to develop concrete local policies on sustainable and healthy food to mitigate and to adapt to climate emergency. Uh, in this sense, the Barcelona Challenge for Good Food and Climate is an example of application of the proposals coming from the Glasgow Declaration. Um, it's like a child of the, of the Glasgow Declaration. Uh, this Barcelona Challenge is based on the C40 Good Food Cities Declaration, and it uses the framework for action of the, of the Milan Pact so in this sense, uh, the reduction of food waste, the shift to planetary health diets and the agroecological transition from the production and distribution perspectives are as main pillars of, of this proposal of the Barcelona Challenge. The challenge is promoted by, of course, the Barcelona City Council, but also uh, the Spanish City Food Network, Red de Ciudades por la Agroecología, uh, the Milan Pact, C40, Sustainable Food Places in the UK, and Tersonville in France. Um, the Barcelona Challenge also proposes as uh, an innovative tool to help cities to assess the um, order of magnitude of the benefits of implementing food policies to tackle climate emergency in terms of GAG reduction, but also economic return and other uh, socio-ecological benefits. Uh, you, can, you can see all of this uh, information in the website uh, that it's uh, already available. Uh, as I said before, the Barcelona Challenge was, was launched the 21st of October in the 7th uh, Global Forum of the Milan Pact uh, by a core group of cities that are pioneers in their food policies for climate action. So it was uh, 14 cities from, the, from 10 countries from the five continents. So and some of them are here, Antananarivo, Guagadudu, Kilimane, Bogota, Belo Horizonte, Rosario, Milan, Barcelona, of course, uh, Glasgow, Birmingham, Lyon, Marseille, Kazan, and some, and some more. And uh, now uh, this Barcelona challenge is open for signatories uh, until March 2022. So we invite you, cities from all around the world, especially those that have signed 
the Glasgow Declaration to join the Barcelona Challenge and to use seeds to strengthen, visibilize, and communicate your food policies for climate action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for the Maria Carascora. So we have another, not declaration, but challenge to sign for all of the cities and representatives and cities and sub-national governments. Now I am introducing you for giving our concluding speech by Shona Robinson, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government. And she's also co-chair sub-national government states and regions and a great supporter of the declaration. Thank you, please. Um. Well, thank you, uh, Hilal, for that introduction. And can I say for your excellent moderating uh, this morning at uh, today's event and to all the wonderful panelists and presenters who have made this morning's session so interesting and insightful. I'm very, very aware that I'm the only thing that stands between you and your lunch. So I just want to, to say a, a, a few remarks. From uh, Izmir to Indonesia, Madagascar to Marseille, uh, to right here in the heart of Glasgow in very iconic settings, uh, today's event has taken us on a tour around some of the incredible action taking place around the world in the name of rising to the twin challenges of the nature and climate emergencies. Our landscapes may look different and we might enjoy different types of food, but we all face unique challenges and opportunities in mobilizing our respective governments and populations to act on climate change. But we are united today as signatories of the Glasgow Declaration in recognizing that our response to the climate challenge must include an inclusive and integrated approach to food policy, as Councillor Susan Aitken said earlier on. And we've already heard from our wonderful panel about what motivated them as leaders to sign this significant declaration. I'd like to add just a, a few of my own reflections on why the Scottish government became the first national government to sign up and pledge to accelerate the development of integrated food policies here in Scotland, while adding our voices to the calls for other national governments and supranational bodies to act. The Scottish Government has long valued the role of food in our national well-being, our economy, and in the very fabric of our society. We don't just eat to sustain life, we eat to connect with friends and loved ones, with our history, with the people and the lands that produce everything that we are fortunate enough to enjoy. However, our relationships with food are not always wholly positive. The impacts of our dietary choices, those we make freely as consumers, and those that are forced upon us in times of scarcity or insecurity can have a profound impact on our health, the quality of our natural environment, and as we've heard today, the very future of our planet. Navigating these impacts and interdependencies is challenging and complex. And we heard from this morning's panel our food systems must not only be climate resilient and sustainable, but they must also be healthy, affordable and equitable. As the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government, I'm convinced that tackling food insecurity must be embedded in how we transform our food systems to align with climate goals. Achieving these aims in tandem requires a joined up whole systems approach and that's why in Scotland we have a vision of becoming a good food nation. A good food nation is a place where people from every walk of life take pride and pleasure in and benefit from the food they produce, buy, cook, serve and eat every day. And I'm sure that vision is shared by many of the speakers we've heard from today for the localities, cities, regions and nations that they re represent. Taking it from ambition to reality requires a comprehensive package of measures that interact across a variety of systems from health to social justice, to knowledge and education, 
to environmental sustainability and national prosperity. And to underpin that package of measures, this year the Scottish Government introduced a Good Food Nation Bill, providing the legislative foundation upon which we'll build our Good Food Nation. And I hope that many of you attending today are able to follow the Bill's progress through the Scottish Parliament this year and celebrate with us when it becomes law. And it may be also gives you an idea of perhaps something you might want to take forward if you haven't already. And may, as you may have gathered, the concept of integration and policy coherence have long been at the heart of the Scottish Government's approach to food policy. And we were uh, so pleased to be able to sign the declaration. And since then, IPES Food and Nourish Scotland, who formed the coalition tasked with drafting the declaration itself, have had great success in providing a platform for signatories to share best practice and insights on developing and monitoring sustainable integrated food policies. And the declaration has really only gathered momentum over time as those who have been involved since the start have used their voices and networks to amplify the declaration's calls and inspire many other governments around the world to join as signatories. I'm certain that as part of the legacy of COP26, we'll continue to learn from each other and share best practice between multiple levels of governance across borders. And that's so important we do that. Today has been a celebration of those successes, but it has also been a call to action. We already have a strong coalition of actors here who are pioneering integrated food policies and strategies to drive positive food system change at a local and regional level. But as the Glasgow Declaration signatories, we agree that that's not enough. The scale of the climate challenge requires us to use every lever at our disposal. And that means action at every level and layer of society and government. Just three days ago, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Islands, Marie Goujon, opened a dialogue on the Glasgow Declaration just one mile away at the multi-level action pavilion in the UN Blue Zone. And I echo the call that she made there for other national and international governments to match the commitments made at sub-national level and to fully integrate food policy as part of their journey to net zero. So in closing, friends, I, I'd like to express my thanks to the organizers of this morning's session, to Glasgow City Council, to Nourish Scotland, the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, the ICLEI and C40. Their tire, tireless work is not only what has brought us here together today, but what has driven the incredible progress delivered upon the platform of the declaration over the past few months. My thanks also goes to all those panelists and speakers who have shared insights from their journey towards sustainable and integrated food systems at all levels. And finally, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I want to thank all of you who have chosen to join us today, either in person or online. It's heartening to see so many uniting in recognition of the importance of food policy as part of our individual and collective responses to climate change. And I'm delighted that we've been able to spotlight these discussions during COP26. And I hope many of you will be able to join us as we continue these conversations over a networking lunch, which I think looks as if it's just about ready. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your stay here in Glasgow. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, May Cabinet Secretary, Ms. Shona Robinson. We should celebrate and congratulate the uh, Government of uh, Scotland two reasons. The one is the Good Food Nation Bill, when it becomes law, will be the first uh, sub-national region or hopefully country in Europe to accepting right to food officially in their land. That's a very, very important. We have been working two, three years on that. Hopefully it will, it will be sometime soon. And the second one, uh, the cabinet is a majority uh, are women members. This is also, I think maybe 
only in Europe or maybe one of the European cabinets that it's so I'm very much proud of the government and all the government suggested. Thank you. So uh, I think during the networking, maybe we can ask uh, questions of each other because we don't want to keep you here so much in kind of more formal uh, situation and we can talk to each other. Please welcome and any question when we are in the networking sitting with the mayors and the representatives of the sub-regions. And we have also, uh, I think we're gonna give the, can you, can you please uh, uh, come, uh, Mrs. Secretary, making this a uh, celebratory uh, kind of, Lunch will be in 10 minutes. They will prepare, but meanwhile, I think we will give the uh, certificates. certificates to all our participants that came here in, in a very difficult situation uh, during the, the middle of COVID. So thank you, please. Thank you, everyone. If I can call um, signatories of the Glasgow Declaration who are here with us in person today to the stage to meet Shona Robinson from the Scottish Government, who will hand over your certificate for signing the Glasgow Declaration while we get the, the lunch from Scottish Produce set up. Thank you very much. How are you going to call? Oh, I think we're just going to come. This, this... This is not meant to be formal. Please, it is not a formal. Any of the representative would like to receive their uh, documents. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us virtually. Merci encore à tous de nous avoir rejoint virtuellement. Uh, we're going to end the Zoom now as we started the in-person networking. Unfortunately, we can't do this. Uh, in we can't do this uh, via Zoom. But thanks again so much to the speakers to the participants, to the signatories, and for everyone for joining us on an early Saturday morning for many of us. Thanks again.